Thank you so much for joining us for this infection prevention discussion on aerosol management best practices for dental hygiene procedures sponsored by Henry Schein. If you have questions throughout the session, please add them to the Q&A. Please note that CE will not be offered for the session. And now I would like to hand it over to our speakers. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rolando Mia and I'm with Zyrus. On behalf of Zyrus and thank you very much to Henry Schein, we're going to spend the next little bit here talking about reducing aerosols in dental hygiene. And we're really excited to be here because with OSAP, we were here last year and I'm gonna introduce you to Michelle Strange, MSDH, RDH, who has been a huge advocate for infection control and more importantly, understanding and making sure that people recognize the importance of upping, you know, leveling up their infection control, especially as it relates to aerosols. So with that, I'm going to basically hand this over and we're gonna start talking to you about reducing aerosols in hygiene. Good afternoon, Michelle, how are you? I'm great, thank you for inviting me to come join you again. I'm really, really sad not to be in person at boot camp. Boot camp is one of my favorite uh, meetings. It's such a great way to kickstart the year, filling my infection control bucket. Um, and so I'm really bummed, but I'm glad that we were able to have this time. That is awesome. So when when we when we think about reducing aerosols and dental hygiene you've been a huge advocate for this for many many years you have a tale to hygienist the podcast that you've done and you've spoken to written many many articles as a matter of fact i also just recently learned at boot camp we've got a large contingent of the armed forces is that correct and va and I really understand. appreciate the service that they have and everything um when when you're talking about leveling up what what what's the context around that how does it kind of take us through the the, the that and how it affects reducing aerosols in, in hygiene well you know at first i would say that I, my journey in aerosol management um was a rocky one i definitely am not the first person to ever talk about it i am definitely on the shoulders of many others that have kind of paved the way for it but my infatuation with it came from being a hygienist that used a ton of aerosol generally gener generating procedures. So, you know, um, airflow, uh, Profijet, my ultrasonics, always since the day I became a hygienist. And unfortunately, I was not using high volume evacuation. I didn't for most of my career know what kind of level mask I was using. I suffered from a ton of air, um, upper respiratory infections and to the point where one of my patients was like, oh man, I love when I come here and you're sick with laryngitis because I don't have to hear your mouth. Like that's where I was in my career where I was always sick every time a patient came. And so when I dove into the world of infection prevention and I learned more about hierarchy of controls and I learned more about engineering controls and knew that I really wanted to stick with biofilm management that I was going to have to clean it up. I was going to have to become um, a more informed professional. And so on my journey, I came across um, products like uh, Zyrus and the Isolite and the Isovac amongst other products out there. And so I, I am I, I would like to say that I have not always leveled up very quickly in my career, but I think this year, well, 2020 was my silver lining is that we're having this discussion now. We are finally, like, it is in our face. We cannot turn away from it. And um, so we really have to get ahead of like, what products are we using? How are we using it? Are we using it effectively? And is the entire team on board? And how do we communicate that to our patients? So for that's that's how my way of leveling up. It's like, how does the team get on board and how do we communicate this to the patient and making sure that I'm being effective and efficient with ergonomics while using these HVEs? Wow, appreciate that. And I, I believe you also worked early in your career in the armed forces. So there was a huge number, a uh, huge learning curve with regard to the how quickly and how many patients needed to be treated, right? Something around that? Yeah, so I rotated through there. Um, I haven't actually been employed by the armed forces, but I rotated there enough to know that it was a fast paced um, place where you're just like, my, 
like in private practice, I'm always like, oh, someone canceled. I can like write up my charts. I can do the things I need to do. And so in that fast paced uh, environment, armed forces and many other uh, practices, I think you have to find what's efficient and effective and it's gonna work for each team member. And also understanding that not every team member is gonna have the same setup and same capabilities. And so you have to kind of ebb and flow with the needs of your team members as well. Cool. So just as a, as a set of context, you mentioned Zyrus. Zyrus, we manufacture the Isolite. For those of you who may not have experience with it or are not quite sure, and for those of you who know, just a quick refresher, Isolite is a system that gives you an alternative for providing isolation, helps you in the productivity in, during the course of your practice. There are, two, there are two systems. There's mouthpieces that fit the anatomy, morphology of the patient, and then there's the Isolite 3, Isodry, Isovac. So we're not going to cover that, but later on, if, if you need to, you, we, will, we can provide more information about that. So in utilizing systems, and, and, and you know, one of the things that we want our viewers to leave here with are practical tips on how to implement them, what to think about, and then what to, what to put in place for, for dealing with those aerosols because you know, COVID is, is there. And not just that, any kind of infectious disease. What are some, how would you kind of highlight the practical tips that you would give people to think about? Well, I would love to share this little video of me using the product, if that's good with you, and maybe just kind of talk through some of it. Um, first on the, that I'll show you, I'm using ISO light and then I'll be using ISO back and I'll kind of explain to you maybe some of my techniques and my tips and some things that I've worked through, um, over the last two years that I've had it. And also why I decide when I use certain one versus the other, does that work? Sure. All right. So like I said, this is, um, the ISO light first. Now, the one thing that did change with me and listen, I love the rhythm of an appointment. Like I really get caught up in knowing that like I got the pulse of what I need to do next. It's my flow. I can always jump back in and I had to change that a little bit. So just kind of get into that, that feeling. It's uncomfortable at first. You might fumble along, but I moved to half mouth treatment. So before I would kind of hit all the away surfaces, all the toward surfaces, and I had to really learn to knock out one side, um, even change uh, the, the tech or the rhythm of the tools that I was using. So before I would do my um, airflow all the way over the mouth, and then I would maybe pick up a ultrasonic if I needed to. And now I was doing kind of a one step, two step, flip it to the other side, one step, two step totally became my new rhythm, but yeah, it's kind of like, oh, you know, like, I don't want to <laughs> have to do that. I'm going to like rewind this a little bit. So here I'm using a second suction because when I use products and devices and tools that have a pretty decent ricochet, um, especially in the anterior teeth, I can't catch it all. My patient's not drowning. I'm just going to pause this. My patient's not drowning, but I'm not, I'm also kind of letting some of that ricochet, that spatter go onto their face, onto their bib, into my world and into the air. So I am using the second suction a lot of times, which is why I tend to gravitate towards my isolite a little bit more because it does give me the ability to have a second uh, HVE tip. So if you're not lucky enough to be in a room where you have the two HVE tubings, um, I, you now have this where you can see that arrow, you can actually add a second one. Am I correct in saying that? Like, I hope so, because that's what yep, I've been doing. Exactly, yes. <laughs> so I add that, so I have that second HVE uh, that can get the anterior teeth. So that's my personal preference. But if I do have to mosey on outside, and that's my Southern way, way of saying move to another operatory because, you know, maybe doc's doing a procedure in mine and I need to go over to another operatory. Um, I also then use Isovac. And so Isovac allows the portability in the hygiene room um, quite a bit for me. And it'll pop up with the Isovac here. So 
you can see there's, you guys have a lot of attachments. I got the attachment that worked for my particular um, dental unit. And I just snapped that on there and I then fit the mouthpiece that would go into the patient's mouth, which is disposable. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I got my setup and I'm good to go. So you can see here, I'm doing that same thing. I think I had the one version earlier. Now they're gray <laughs> and this one is white. I was in this room that did have that second HBE, so I was able to do that as well. It doesn't have the light, but I personally have loops, so I feel like I can definitely get away with it. It's not the end all be all. My doctor does love the light though, so he doesn't, he's not a fan of uh, going without it. And what from the infection control standpoint, if I could show you guys this, is that it comes apart, the isovac. This part is really great. So I pull off that mouthpiece and then I kind of pull it apart so I can do proper instrument sterilization and it can go through um, the sterilizer, not as one whole unit and get, get its proper disinfection. So the thing is though, I will tell you, I don't, I'm having a harder time with this particular one in my transient clinic where I have someone who might be volunteering, someone that might be new. And then if they aren't familiar with making sure I have two arms and two pieces that come together. Uh, so just know your clinic. Um, I am in a clinic uh, and another clinic where my assistants are, I would put them in my pocket and take them everywhere I could go because they're so fantastic. They are spot on. They know all the parts and pieces. They're very well aware of the instrument reprocessing um, protocol for this and it's beautiful. So just know your clinic. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that's what I, I have awesome. there. So you mentioned, and, and I, I'm kind of keying off on it because <clears throat> you'd, you'd said this before, regarding ensuring that your team or the, the, your, your colleagues understand what, what, what context around training, what advice or what tips would you give to, you know, clinicians about training, about uh, getting into the rhythm? You mentioned early on that it did require you to kind of adjust the, uh, yep. the, the approach that you had. What, what tips would you give regarding that? Well, I would definitely say, Zyrus, you guys do a fantastic job of training upfront. Um, when I first had my orientation with you guys, you kind of put those planted those seeds in my head and that made the transition a lot a lot easier because I had to change my grip on my ultrasonic to reach that distal of a third molar um, you know there was a lot of little nuances that I think I would have been frustrated about if I had not had that seed planted in my head and when it happened I go okay I just have to readjust so I definitely um you know, commend you guys over there for the great training. Um, once I got used to it, what I feel is that it, the team now needs to understand what is happening. Uh, and this was a shift in 2020 because yeah, I might've told my front office team, like I'm doing this new thing, but now the conversations we are having are to prep the patient about the new things that we are doing, how we're keeping them protected, how we're keeping us protected. Um, they might, you know, depending on their level of the disease, Michelle might choose certain tools. One of them is uh, a device that you probably possibly had in the doctor's side. Well, Michelle is using that now in the hygiene room. So it's very comfortable. If you won't get that drowning feeling, you know, really kind of beefs it up for me before the patient even gets to the office. And then when the patient is sitting in my chair, maybe the assistant will sit them. They're also having these same conversations. So we're all on board as a team. Now, when you do have that missing link, it does get a little hard. And I was also struggling with that because I was having to have that same conversation with the patient over and over and over again. And I was starting to find myself getting a little behind in my schedule because I was having to add this little, okay, this is what it's gonna be. This is what it looks like. This is what it's gonna feel like. This is why I'm doing it. And if that stuff can just happen at the front of the appointment or before the appointment even comes and we are saying it as a unit, it has made my appointments flow so much better now. That's awesome. So training is important, understanding mm -hmm. the context around it and then communication with the patient. 
We got a couple of questions here um, yeah. with regard to, you know, is Isolite, Isovac sterilizable in an autoclave? And I'll, I'll answer that one. The actual components, 100%, the mouthpieces are one-time use. After they're used, to make it really simple, you discard them. They're made out of a polymer, no latex, no silicone, so that they fit and they're designed around the anatomy of the mouth so that they fit no allergies and that type of stuff. Another question, Michelle, that came up here was, you know, do you have any experience using this um, hygiene for patients with special needs? I personally do not have any, um, any experience with that. Um, so I'm hoping maybe somebody else out in the world could answer that question. Maybe I know there's a little OSAP messaging out there. I, I think it's all going to be a matter of like their levels of understanding um, what they're able to tolerate, how you communicate that. Is it communicating with a patient and a parent, a caregiver? Uh, but I think it's Honestly, I think it's easier because they have a ability to prop their mouth open. It's soft. It's easy. It keeps their tongue back. It makes it, I mean, I would imagine, again, I'm just postulating because I don't have the experience, but I would imagine um, if you are struggling with somebody that wants to constantly close, the tongue is going, being the curious little creature that it is with a device like Isolate in the mouthpiece that you would be able to retract everything and you'd be more efficient. And so even if it's a little weird and uncomfortable in the five minutes, at least it's not a horrible experience of 50 minutes because of whatever might be happening in the appointment. Right, right. I appreciate that. I, I'm not a clinician, and uh, uh, but I can tell you that we've had quite a few uh, clinicians who almost exclusively use the Isolite for patients with special needs, as well as patients that have TMJ or joint issues. Mm, the bite good. block in, the, in, in it is, is, um, is compliant. It's stiff enough to keep the mouth open, so patients rest it, but it's still stiff enough so that they can't bite down. So what happens is there isn't pressure on the joints, so for TMJ, it's a lot more comfortable. And then for patients with special needs, because, and Michelle hit it, it keeps the tongue out of the way, it obturates the throat and it keeps everything away. What happens is the potential for that tongue to get cut or, or the patient to swallow something becomes dramatically decreased. Seriously, How about medication. aerosols? You, you, you mentioned leveling, you know, multiple layers and like to, because this is about reducing aerosols, what's the experience you have? And um, I like the context. It's not just one system, if I understand correctly, right? Yeah. So, you know, it really depends on currently now my standard, everything has changed uh, in 2020. Um, but I, I choose based on the patient's level of disease and needs. Um, and I tell them I have a few options. I'm going to set them back. We're going to assess their periodontal health, their camber scores, all of that. And then we, I will make a decision on what I'm going to use based on my aerosol generating procedures, if they're necessary. Um, now, once I get back to, you know, conventional capacity where I can use it on a regular basis, uh, I, for me, then it is based on if I am going to spend a lot of time with the, if I'm just hitting like the high spots with a, an ultrasonic, I might just use a, a an easy, um, HVE, uh, you know, handheld unit. And then if I'm going to be spending a little bit more time and really kind of getting in there, I'm going to choose something because it's more comfortable for the patient, really. And that's been the feedback from uh, my friends that I, um, you know, torture on a regular basis and try out all these different HVE tips on. Um, they always say like that was way more comfortable and, and they see it and they're like, uh, OK, but it's always way more comfortable for them. And gaggers included. If I size properly, gaggers tolerate it pretty well. There's always the outliers um, when we think of that, you know, bell curve. But I, I think ultimately, if I size appropriately, and that takes a few trial and error, and trying it on yourself and trying it on your team members, I think is a, a very important um, aspect of getting used to the product. Appreciate that. Yeah, with regard to gaggers and and this uh, the context around that because it's keeping the tongue and, the, and everything out of the way and you're not having to retract. Actually, what we've heard is gag patient, patients who are gag sensitive mm -hmm. um, really like the system. So I think that's, that's a really cool thing. 
the the context around aerosol control, you know, the the align it with the procedures you're doing, and then how much you you think you're you're being is being generated. I think it's also really 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 cool. So appreciate the the context around that. If you were uh, and we're gonna, there are a couple of additional questions in here. Uh, one quick one, the, from, a, um, uh, from a infection control, what's the process that you use for uh, cleaning and sterilizing the system? Um, so, well, you can definitely do the two-step disinfection on the part that stays within the unit. Um, we pull off the pieces. Again, we have a really nice standard operating procedure around uh, each one of our HVE tips. So they know what parts can go in the autoclave, what rack to put it on the autoclave. Can it go into the ultrasonic? Are we wiping it? We have a very clear standard operating procedure for each one of those. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, it's all comes back to instructions for use because my isolate is very different than my isovac. Uh, so I think you just need to look at the uh, IFUs for that, which I'm sure you're hearing a lot of at boot camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. So um, are you using isolate during this pandemic? <laughs> yes, um, I am definitely hand scaling way more. Um, just going back, I feel like I went back a decade in 2020 in my patient treatment options. But like I said, I am very strategic on when I'm doing aerosol generating procedures, who I'm doing it on, who's my patient afterwards, do I have all my PPE, have you know, their health history. I'm very, I'm taking a lot, it's multifactorial, my decisions to say the least. Um, but yeah, I'm definitely, and my doctor 100% is. That is awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for that. So, in looking in 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 providing you know practical things, if you were to summarize or highlight the top three things, either to do or not to do, mm -hmm. with regard to aerosols and hygiene, what would how would you kind of frame those for our viewers? Well, the one thing I think that we don't have bigger conversations around in dentistry, in dental hygiene specifically, is the vacuum. Mm. We, we, I, I, forum after forum, I see time and time again, it's about the HVE tips, which is definitely critical. However, they're only gonna work as good as your vacuum system. And like, do you guys have standard operating procedures around how you maintain it when you're changing the traps? What are you using? Um, are we checking it? Are we checking our amalgam separator? Are we doing all these? Have we tested it? Can we use HVE in every single room? Figuring all of that out, I think that's a huge part of aerosol management and one a conversation that we are just not having enough. And we, it's, it's just not talked about enough, I think. Um, also, I think that um, not one HVE tip will do it all and will work for everybody in the team. I think you have to uh, be strategic about which what you choose. Um, you might need accessories. Remember these things, I mean, especially if you're using handhelds, they're heavy. Uh, that is just a future wrist, you know, ergonomic issue later on. So be smart clinicians, take care of yourself, do the research to make sure that you are using something that works for your op, works for your patients, that you're capable of wielding. And I'll be like, and don't feel the shame if one doesn't work for you and it works for the other hygienist, because I mean, we are all different clinicians. And then um, I would say to the, the doctors or the purchasers out there, don't buy anything without talking to the team. <laughs> I think that this is where, especially, I and mean, you probably heard this a lot, um, people purchase something like Isolite or Isovac, and then they don't talk to their team. They don't have the orientation to be like, okay, your rhythm is going to change. How you grip an instrument is going to change a little bit, but here's the that's, that might be a momentary con, but here's all the pros. And they're not a part of that purchasing, um, that purchasing, uh, I guess, scenario. And they get a little frustrated and things get stuck in a drawer and then it feels like a waste of money. And then everybody is just jaded about the situation. So those would be my three, I think. That's, 
you know, the context that you set around the evacuation system and how effective it's, you're right, regardless of what instruments, what tools you have on the chair, if, you're, if your suction system is not efficient doing a good job, it quite doesn't matter. So I, I very, very much appreciate that. Um, I would say too, um, the, the, the idea of aerosols is a big one and we spent quite a bit of time. And one of the things that, that we've learned around and isolate and there's going to be, oh, check this out. We're, I'm not gonna cover a lot here, but tomorrow Dr. Farouk Hakim is going to be doing a presentation. He's gonna share some more uh, detail around some of these studies, but Isolite generates all, kind of a negative pressure area inside the mouth, intercepts things before the patient expels them. So as Michelle, or as, as you're working in the mouth, uh, it, you're dealing a lot with the spatter, which the second HVE can deal with. And you'll find that you can reduce that dramatically. So the layering and having multiple, and then training. I told, oh goodness gracious. I couldn't even imagine, you know, I, we've heard numerous times that things show up. If, if something showed up and you weren't trained, would you use it, Michelle? Or, well, you're different though, right? You have this- Yeah, I'm an early adopter. However, I am just as frustrated as many clinicians. And in if you throw that at me during my regular pa patient schedule and you want me to integrate something and do all the other things I'm doing, it's just probably, I don't have the mental bandwidth for that situation. So I think it is- you know, again, having the conversations ahead of time, being a part of the team in the whole purchasing of it, implementation, making sure it's going to work for everybody, everybody's room, um, everybody's setup, and also then communicating that to the front office so that they can communicate it to the patients. And then we can all be having the same conversation with our patients about how the steps that we're taking to reduce aerosols and protect them and protect us ultimately. That is awesome. You know, Michelle, it's always a pleasure. I really appreciate it. I love the, the you're very pragmatic with regard to the, the advice that you give, you, real hands-on, and I can't thank you enough. I think it's great that, that you do that. From a, from a Zyrus perspective, and <clears throat> again, I'd like to basically thank, and you know, thank Henry Schein for sponsoring this event. Um, if you wanna learn more, shop or reach out, please reach out to your local Henry Schein representative to discuss any of these systems, or you could go to henryshinedental.com slash isolite, or you can go to the Zyrus website and, and uh, you, can, you can get some information out there. There was a question about, do we sell a chapstick type thing? There is Lou, but you can just use a regular chapstick. So that's it. So Michelle Strange, thank you so much. <clears throat> Our viewers, uh, hope this was helpful and, and informative for you. Really appreciate the uh, opportunity for us to come here. And I want to thank Henry Shine again for that. And hope you all have a wonderful rest of the OSAP boot camp. Michelle, it's always a pleasure to see you. Yeah, thank you. I hope everybody enjoys. Awesome. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And uh, everyone, great to be here. <laughs>